When emergency first responders were overwhelmed by Los Angeles County's most destructive fire yet, a band of surfers, along with their neighbors and friends, stepped up to defend their home turf in Malibu. Their devotion to home drove them to show up for their community during the fire and for years afterward. And now, a model they call the Community Brigade Program could change everything leading to more lives and more homes saved during the increasing wildfires across not just California, but the world. Join reporter Adriana Cargill from KCRW, NPR's All Things Considered, Crooked Media, and more, as she investigates a wildfire story that is not depressing, but is, in fact, a clear hope for the future. Listen now to Sandcastles, an award-winning podcast about home, how we create it, and why we fight so hard for it. This week, ESG is good business. Just don't call it that. And later, the news. California might ban Skittles. AI chatbots got extensions already. The e-bike act is back. And deep fakes are already everywhere. But first, I'm Quinn Emmett, and this is important, not important. Science for people who give a shit. The newsletter features the most important science news, how to think about it, and what the hell you can do about it. Hit subscribe right now to get this newsletter and my conversations with the world's smartest people every single week. You can find the email version and links to everything at importantnotimportant.com or right into your show notes. It's March 24th, 2023. Here's your weekly action steps. Submit your comment to keep Virginia in the very successful East Coast and very lucrative RGGI. Some folks need shelter, some need water or food. The data says giving them agency and straight cash works better. Do that by donating to Give Directly. Healthcare is a universal human right. Set up a new monthly donation to the legendary Partners in Health to provide care first to those who need it the most. You know what's cool? A billion oysters. Plant them with the Billion Oyster Project and help clean up New York's waters. And now, today's big question. This isn't complicated, folks. Alongside books, teenagers, periods, and the Statue of David just this week, the notion of even considering ESG parameters in an investment fund has become one of 2023's most significant and dumbest political footballs. Florida's built a whole stupid political machine fighting it. The Senate passed an even stupider bill banning it, queuing up Green Joe's first veto. That's not to say ESG is perfect. In fact, it's become pretty difficult to pin down exactly what the hell ESG is. That's in part because ESG is a bunch of great ideas smashed together in one acronym. Drilling down each of those ideas to more comprehensively and aggressively consider environmental, social, and governance standards, all vitally important and overdue, doesn't really have a standardized, measurable anything. Which means formalizing them and gambling trillions on them through ratings and the like, is asking for trouble. It's problematic, right? Does a complete lack of standards but need to burnish reputations among retail investors set the stage for massive greenwashing? You betcha. Friends, this is a great example of many things can be true at once. Capitalism can make civilizations prosperous, drive innovation, and fund the arts. Capitalism also has a track record of being horrifically exploitive of ecosystems and people, and self-regulation more or less does not work. This is all to say I'm fully cognizant that a corporation's traditional purpose is to create value for shareholders. But that is exactly why considering even just the E in ESG isn't putting politics over profits. It's the opposite. Check it out. Since the beginning of time, two things have been true. One, Bacteria are 10 steps ahead of us and will outlive us. Two, we have been able to boil investing down to two core, very simple principles. One, capital conservation, protect what you've got, and capital appreciation, try to get more. Now, the mechanisms to execute those have become myriad and Byzantine and often automated, but the principles remain because they're so easily understood. Take a look around, assess risk, assess opportunities, make some moves, try to keep them kind of balanced out. Don't be an ignoramus. 
and don't be greedy. Now, forget ESG, the label, the whole thing. Just consider that last part. Don't be an ignoramus. As Morgan Housel described it about personal investing, good investing is not necessarily about making good decisions. It's about consistently not screwing up. Look around. In 2023 and beyond, an era when things are unpredictable, screwing up includes ignoring the real-world climate impacts already flooding our doorstep and the millions of good people trying to build and participate in a capitalist system that isn't, you know, monstrously extractive. So pretending the E is anything but a new prism to assess risk is dumb. Ignoring that it may also be the most lucrative opportunity of all time is even dumber. Here's the first piece. Your fund or investments or company should anticipate regulatory changes that are, yes, taking forever, but probably inevitable. This applies to so many things through history. Regulation is a fickle mistress, often decades too late, and sometimes, I know, overused. But any well-run company should be able to put their finger to the wind and say, yes, the times they are are changing, and then methodically change their business practices to at least align with the general principles of future regulations. And that is so when regulators do eventually, inevitably knock on their office door, I'm kidding, there's no more offices, <laughs> Anyways, then those same companies can smirk, knowing the hard work is already done. And this is a result that typically makes shareholders very, very happy. My children and I actually call this doing a favor to your future self. And look, whether we're talking about literally just once, putting your Crocs in the shoe bin at the end of the night, on the other hand, producing toothpaste without fucking forever chemicals in it, your future self will always be appreciative. Number two. Your fund, investments, or company should anticipate consumer trends, especially among the youths. Now, in case you missed it, the youths are all about saving the planet. The planet, you smirk again, will be fine. And you're correct. Geology is very cool and very old. But think of it instead like saving the planet as they know it, or that you told them about. And then consider that these young folks will live on our rock far longer than you or me, and you may finally understand why they reluctantly, and then forcefully, rallied behind Green Joe. But also why they are now absolutely furious about the Willow Project, why secondhand clothing and furniture shops have exploded in popularity, and why those folks keep suing fossil fuel companies wherever they can, and more. Now, if you're more of a soft pants trendy person, furious may not seem like a consumer trend to you. But if I'm a company, and I'm looking around at successive generations demanding companies, goods, and services with a conscience, I would try to adjust accordingly by becoming one of those. And then, assuming I could remember my password, I'd buy a bunch of TikTok ads to support my efforts. Because if Nutter Butter can do it, we can too. And sure, no one could have predicted a Nutter Butter resurgence. But making it a company policy to make things the youths want and need, and preferably out of materials that used to be part of something else, assembled by nice folks who can enjoy a living wage and can take a day off when their own youths are sick, is a really smart way to reliably stay in everyone's good graces and maybe even become something they make one of those dance videos about. Number three, your fund, investments, and company should seek access to new markets. This is crazy. I say this all the time, and still people shrug. And it's strange because we have to electrify every automobile and building on the planet. That doesn't seem like very small potatoes to me, nor the downstream markets of those. I mean, look, build a gazillion e-bikes, build a bazillion EV chargers, maintain those chargers, make software to manage the chargers, repair water pipes, wastewater monitoring, zero carbon sneakers, um, build storm gardens, uh, make telehealth, EV manufacturing, uh, building 4 million new electrified homes, sustainably harvested cardigans. You, I love cardigans. We know that. Geothermal anywhere. Equitable, healthy urban design. Again, the storm gardens. Solar over reservoirs. Solar over farmland. Connecting all the solar. Battery recycling, eventually. Pumped hydro. Heat pumps. Uh, food waste. Induction stoves. Composting services. I mean, have you seen all of the EV and battery money just gushing into red states? Do you understand where that money is coming from? 
What about the advertising and marketing and legal and financing and HR for all that shit? Are you listening? Do people at your company not wear sneakers? Wouldn't they like a nice pair made from sustainably harvested tree bark or whatever that could then be recycled into, I don't know, medicine or pencils or something? Please don't tell me you still make people wear loafers, but even then, recycle loafers. Look, we ran the numbers on these new markets, and the revenues totaled up to all of the fucking money. Can I interest you in all of the fucking money? Number four, your fund investments in company should reduce costs. This doesn't even have to be that complicated. You can buy clean energy from almost anywhere, virtually at least, and Energy Star appliances, that little sticker, those things have been around since Home Alone 2 lost in New York, underrated. Here's some other things that reduce costs and improve profits. Stop wasting all that clean energy by using smart appliances. Stop wasting food. There are plenty of startups that will pick up your company's extra food or food waste to redistribute it or compost it. Stop wasting paper and packaging materials. Look at Walmart's zero waste program. Another idea, healthier employees. Those are fun, even when we're all working remotely, which can also save businesses money and save transportation emissions too. This is great. Lastly, insulation might not be sexy to you, but you wouldn't believe how excited well-stuffed drywall and double-paned windows get me. Number five, real talk time. Your fund investments and company should protect your assets and investments against real-world climate impacts. Millions of historically marginalized people in what are called sacrifice zones around the world have been suffering through not fun climate impacts for decades, from water and air pollution to heat and drought and sunny day flooding and regular flooding and sea level rise. The IRA, which seems to be completely reinvigorating American industry, causing quite the kerfuffle across the pond, is an imperfect trade-off of oodles of those future profits, kind of in exchange for keeping those same sacrifice zones around for just a while longer, which really sucks. The thing about many of those sacrifice zones, though, is that they're either where fossil fuel infrastructure is and or where climate impacts are most likely to come to life, to affect, harm, or kill people but also absolutely trash whatever's within striking distance, like homes or businesses your bank loans to, or insurers, or whatever. It's not great. And it's also not super fair to people who've lived in those places for generations. Home is home, and it's terrible to have to leave. But while many folks now know they're being poisoned and we can try to fix that, others aren't, and find themselves underwater on mortgages and insurance policies that simply won't come due, when the big one comes. We have to ask hard questions. And money talks. All that's to say, continuing to support that infrastructure in any conceivable way is a big fat F plus in managing risk 101. On the other hand, helping to fund or provide goods and services around 4 million new electrified homes and pedestrian-friendly urban areas and suburbs that should become urban areas in places where climate adaptation is more manageable That's a nice way to make a buck. And here's where this all comes together. The longer your company continues to invest in, loan to, subsidize, get energy from, or require products made from fossil fuel infrastructure, the more likely climate impacts will continue to grow. It's circular. And the more your investments are a threat from melting or drowning or both, to say nothing of the people who live and work there. The longer it takes companies to adapt to upcoming regulatory changes, even just disclosure rules, the more likely climate impacts become. The longer trends like sustainable manufacturing, EVs, clean power, heat pumps and more take to become as common as Swiffers or whatever, the more likely climate impacts become and your company and investments and fund whatever they suffer. On the other hand, choosing to see these exposures, not just as massive risks, but as opportunities to directly reduce the risks for yourself and everyone else can make your fund, your investments, your company, whatever, a boatload of cash. So ignore the performative bullshit. Ignore the grifters. You are smarter than this. You know that forever, wars, whatever, market risks have always been real-world risks, reputational risks, and political risks, standing on each other's shoulders in a trench coat, no matter what label or acronym we use. I've got a poster in my office, and it says, work hard and be nice to people. 
And that, too, is easier said than done. But it's not difficult to understand, because it doesn't change. So do the right thing with your money, which also happens to be the least risky thing, and maybe even the most profitable thing ever. And now, the news. In climate change news, the E-Bike Act was reintroduced in Congress, and I am so excited, we're going to have more on that soon. Number two, the new season of Amy Westervelt's incredible Drilled podcast is out, and this year it's a crossover with damages as they explore oil reserves and how ExxonMobil is exploiting them. Number three, I love the Third Act protesters who came after the big banks who fund fossil fuels this weekend. And number four, the final rules on EV tax credits are coming, and everyone is both excited and annoyed, apparently. In COVID news, a new Medicare designation may save the most vulnerable rural hospitals that are failing after COVID. Number two from Atulga One Day, the aftermath of pandemic requires as much focus as the start. Check it out in the show notes to understand why. In food and water news, can we make and popularize toilets that don't use running water? Number two, yep, that's right, California might ban Skittles and Mountain Dew, apparently. Number three, we desperately need a new economics of water. In health and bio news, the FDA recommended two RSV vaccines for older adults, a huge public health win. Number two, we can learn a lot about how to eradicate homelessness from Houston and Helsinki. Number three, the 988 suicide hotline is expanding LGBTQ services with 24-7 chat and text. Hooray. Number four, we really should celebrate the enormous, enormous impact that President George W. Bush's emergency program for AIDS relief, called PEPFAR, has had over the past 20 years. And of course, the tens of thousands of people who fought for it over and over and over. Number five, in the show notes, the best and worst American cities for allergy sufferers, or according to my wife, literally everywhere she goes. And last, in computer news, AI, so much to say, there's only so much I can say. It's moving so fast. Uh, as of yesterday, the first chat GPT plugins are here. It's moving fast. Meanwhile, vocal uh, deepfakes router control, Trump deepfakes are already out there. It's wild, folks. It's a lot to keep up with. That's it for this week. Hit subscribe to get next week's issue straight to your feed. To go deeper, visit importantnotimportant.com. Thank you for being a part of our community, and thanks for giving a shit. Have a great weekend.